Thank you for joining us for our live premiere of The Vote and May Month's Celebration of Women's History Month. I'm Lucretia Marie Anderson, May Month's Manager of Historical Education. Uh, and we invite you to join us after the dramatic interpretation, which will be a live video premiere. Um, we'll be followed by a panel discussion on the history of women's mm -hmm. suffrage um, with historian Elbatrice Belchitz, who is author of the book Richmond, Virginia, which is part of Arcadia Publishing's Black America series, and Lynn Johnston, who is an equal rights advocate and the Centennial Committee co-chair for the League of Women Voters in the Richmond metro area. We hope that you enjoy the dramatic interpretation, and please join us for a Q&A discussion following the program. Well, shall we begin? I want to thank Mrs. James H. Dooley. Oh, you may refer to me as Mrs. Sally May Dooley. Thank you, and pardon uh, Mrs. Sally May Dooley and Miss Nora Houston for joining us today and agreeing to give us your perspective on quite a contentious issue for you, women's suffrage in the U.S. My pleasure, and thank you. This, in my opinion, is one of the greatest issues of my time. Of course, along with the continued movement toward equal rights for all of humanity, including our Negro sisters and brothers. <clears throat> if either of you wouldn't mind giving a brief introduction of yourselves, I would greatly appreciate it. Aunt Sally, would you like to start? Well, of course. Thank you. <laughs> my name is Mrs. Sally Mae Dooley. I am no great orator, nor do I give over to bombast. So while I am flattered, I find myself a bit uncomfortable here today. But as Nora insisted that my point of view on the subject was of importance, here I sit. I am the wife of businessman, philanthropist, and former legislator James Henry Dooley. Maymont is our home. The estate is lovely and welcoming to all who have a chance to visit. Thank you. And would you tell us a little bit about the women's organizations you belong to and your roles there? Oh, certainly. I have a lineage that I can trace all the way back to one of the first royal governors here in our beautiful state of Virginia. And so I offered my time on the committees of several organizations to continue to uphold the traditions and histories of the Commonwealth, and to be with other ladies who understand what it means to do so. I was founding president of the Daughters of the American Revolution's Richmond chapter, and sat on the executive committee of the Society of Colonial Dames and the like. So you see, it's important, very important, that we remember and hold up our traditions. That is what it means to be a lady. Something I fear the young women today forget. Not altogether their fault though, given all of the topsy-turviness of the world these days. It is hard for a lady to remember to be a lady when there are forces about demanding her attention to be held on men's concerns and Mm-hmm. Uh, Ms. Houston, would you mind telling us about yourself and involvement in the suffrage movement? I'm Eleonora Claire Houston, better known as Nora. And my mother, Josephine, is Uncle James' sister. I suppose as far as my background is concerned, well, I have been called a deeply spiritual and socially conscious artist. I joined the Art Club of Richmond, where Uncle James was an avid supporter and lecturer when I was in my adolescent years. I suppose I'm most well known for starting the Atelier Studio here in Richmond with Adele Clark, my lifelong partner, and maybe somewhat lesser known for my work with the Equal Suffrage League with my mother and Aunt Alice, who would later, which uh, that league would later become the Virginia League of Women Voters after the 19th Amendment was passed and the vote secured for us. I also worked hard to collaborate with the Federation of Colored Women's Clubs to form the Richmond Commission on Interracial Cooperation. 
We wanted to see Negro women have their opportunities to vote as well and try to disperse with some of the blockades preventing them from doing so. Hmm. Mrs. Dooley, would you mind telling us more about the Virginia Association opposed to women's suffrage? Um, you were a member of this organization, is that correct? Oh, certainly. I was on the executive committee of the association. And of course, I don't mind. That is the essence of why we are all here, I gather. I am certain that my niece has already told you a great deal. The association was of the utmost importance to me. It was our mission to uphold the traditional role of women in the home. Women are to run their households, take care of the families, and be treated with delicacy and care. All concepts that, once again, seem to have fallen by the wayside. I can't begin to imagine why these suffragettes wanted to disrupt their own ways of living by marching to the ballot. We've had this discussion many times before, Aunt Sally. You know this was an important step for women to take in securing a future for ourselves in the governance of this country. Our controlling influence as women is purity of thought and action. Men look up to us in this way, as the embodiment of all that is good. When woman has lost this influence, she has lost her best protection. As far as I am concerned, we are now perilously close to losing our rights as women. Soon, women will be expected to come out of the homes and into political office and into the workforce. Aunt Sally, women have been in the workforce and out of the home already. And as for homemakers, not having the vote, I would stand to argue, who better? Now, those women who have the fortune to stay home have far more time to devote to civic duties than those gentlemen who are devoted to business or other such endeavors. And besides, Negro women, particularly in the South, have been in the workforce for centuries. Part of what we all understood also is that should women win the vote, black women would have the vote as well. And this was a hard pill to swallow and a well-documented driving force for the women opposed to suffrage. <clears throat> well, it's just not something that a woman like me may ever get used to. We believed firmly that should women secure the vote, our entire way of life would change. Just the idea. We just weren't willing to see the ways that we conduct our social lives here in Virginia uprooted by the potential to be outnumbered by Negro women at the polls. I have never lived in a society where that was even a possibility. I won't be judged for my point of view. It was and always has been the way of things. Now, if you'll excuse me, Nora, thank you for the invitation. I'll take my leave. Aunt Sally. Ms. Houston, thank you for sharing your background. Would you mind sharing your point of view on why securing suffrage for women was so important to you and your organization? It was simply time for women to be enfranchised with the same rights to represent ourselves and our interests in the same way that men have. I stood on street corners to declare this fact. I remember one incident in particular where stones were hurled my way as I made a speech simply to declare that to be a woman was to be part of the human race. <laughs> and if we are all to be part of the human race, we must be represented equally in our courts and in our government. I keep one of those stones with me to this day. It reminds me of the sacrifice and victory that we can now declare. The Equal Suffrage League circulated hundreds of pamphlets hoping to compel women to advocate for their right to vote. One of them is entitled, Who Represents Her? Do you remember what arguments were laid out there? Of course I do. Essentially, it pointed out that if a woman is to answer for any of her debts to society, say, a widow fails to pay her taxes, or an impoverished sister feels compelled to steal to make ends meet, or forges a signature when she has no support from her husband. Now, in these cases, men are not inclined to take her place, to represent her in her penalties, so then, 
Why should men be allowed to represent all women at the ballot box? If men will not take a woman's place in prison, why should he supplant her knowledge and wisdom in making decisions for our government? Will you tell us more about the Interracial Cooperation Commission? Well, I would be happy to, but I have invited two women who I think may be more an authority on our work there together. Ah, they've arrived just now. Or uh, Mrs. Walker, such a pleasure. Please, come sit. I must ask after Aunt Sally, I'm afraid. No, please, continue. Oh, we appreciate you coming to speak with us, Mrs. Walker and Mrs. Stokes. Would you please introduce yourself? Uh, Mrs. Maggie Lena Walker. Mrs. Aura Brown Stokes. Thank you so much. Uh, Mrs. Walker, would you mind telling us just a little about yourself and your civic and advocacy work here in Richmond? Well, where to begin? I suppose I'll start with St. Luke's. That's where it all began in my youth. Working with the benevolent organization there when I was 14 and helping to care for the infirm. Eventually, I began teaching. But when I married Armistead, of course, uh, all that stopped. Women weren't allowed to teach once we became wives. Nevertheless, I found myself continuing to work with St. Luke's. I worked my way up through the ranks there founding and editing the newspaper, and securing jobs and training for women. And then, of course, we created the Penny Savings Bank, where I was the bank president. We were looking to empower ourselves economically, invest in black businesses in Jackson Ward, secure our own welfare, all of that. It was difficult, but Necessary work. Thank you. And Mrs. Stokes? Yes. Uh, it is interesting to give biographical information about oneself in this way, but I have ex an extensive background in sociological work and education and have trained as a teacher as well. I'm now working as a probationary officer for women and girls in the juvenile courts of Richmond, for which I take no salary. I've headed up numerous committees and organizations here in Richmond and regionally over the years, focused on justice and well-being for black women. Thank you. Now, I believe Ms. Houston invited you here to speak briefly about your work with the Commission on Interracial Cooperation and with getting black women to the polls. Yes. Before, we were largely left out of the women's suffrage movement here in Richmond. And then, because of our own segregation laws here, we weren't allowed to join the League of Women Voters. That didn't mean we didn't keep fighting and educating in our own communities. That's right. Mm -hmm. We formed our own Negro League of Women Voters, where I was the president. It wasn't until after the amendment finally passed that we started to gain some traction and build coalitions with white women, such as Nora, and the Commission on Interracial Cooperation, to get black women to the polls to exercise our rights. They helped us with some of our fundraising efforts as well. What did you find to be the biggest challenges for black women in voting? <laughs> well, <sighs> There were just so many. <laughs> From the literacy tests that were required in order to establish eligibility to cast our ballots, mm -hmm. to the polling tax that folks had difficulty paying. Black women in particular are often the lowest paid on the wage system, so paying a tax to exercise our right to vote was a big sacrifice. Just getting Negro women to the polls in the first place mm -hmm. was daunting. And I don't just mean physically transporting, I'll talk about that in a minute, but convincing women who are too tired to even care for their families at the end of a long work day, let alone make the effort to put up with the opposition to our voting once they made the effort to get there. We had to educate on the importance of us showing up. We needed our folks to understand that despite the setbacks, their votes mattered. Yes. 
despite being workers, homemakers, mothers, in fact, because of those conditions, it was of the utmost importance to exercise our civic duty, especially after all the fighting to win the vote. We created Richmond's first voter registration drive. Maggie and I made speeches all over the city. <laughs> At the end of the day, 80% of black voters in this city were women, mm -hmm. 80%. <laughs> When the registration days came in 1920, the first time we were allowed as black women to do so, we worked with Nora and Adele to organize transportation for those in need. Oh, we were both very familiar with organizing. You know, Maggie headed up the trolley boycott in 1904 to oppose the Jim Crow laws and lynching and unequal education for black children. Folks were tired of being forced to sit in the back of those trolleys after a day's work, heading back and forth to white folks' homes and the factories and such. Yes. <laughs> and I wasn't going to let the lack of registrars at City Hall force us back either. You see, they had only assigned us one registrar for the Negro women in the basement, <laughs> as opposed to three upstairs for the white women. The Aura and I set up a phone tree network to make sure that our women would spend as little time as possible waiting in the lines. We couldn't have them sacrificing their jobs, but because of our phone tree, we had so many women showing up that <laughs> that man, oh, what was his name, Aura? Oh, yes, uh, uh, Registrar Woodson. That, yes, <laughs> Woodson. He was trying to close up early with a hundred more women down in that basement. <laughs> now, I insisted we needed Negro registrars, myself included, to circumvent the obvious discrimination. Unfortunately, we still had some turned away in September, but no matter, in October, we were back. Oh yes, <laughs> and well, even then, it took Nora and Adele appealing to the city electoral board to keep the offices open because we had so many wanting to register. <laughs> oh, oh, remember? Oh, when that officer, Officer Ingram, thought we were through and said, I guess there will not be many to turn away this time when closing time comes. <laughs> I looked right at him and said, there is more to come. Mm -hmm. I've got them lined up in Jackson Ward waiting for the word. They are ready to come when I call them. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it was a triumph. Oh. Well, it was important to start to take advantage of our recent enfranchisements. Yes. It was a day I'm sure my mother and her enslavement never imagined we would see. Mm. We had earned the right to be involved in our local government and it had to be done. Listen, women are the guardians of our city's youth. And in my opinion, it would have been irresponsible to leave the task of selecting our councilmen to just the men. Yes. Because the children of Richmond's future may have depended on that election. Well, thank you both so much for your time and insight. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> My pleasure. All right, just going to make sure that uh, we're all unmuted. Uh, welcome back, uh, Elvatrice and Lynn, and thank you so much for joining us for this panel discussion um, of the vote. Yes. So um, just as a reminder, in case you joined us um, after the start of the program, uh, we are delighted to have with us today Elvatrice Belches, who's author of the book Richmond, Virginia, um, which is part of Arcadia Publishing's Black America series, and Lynn Johnston, um, Equal Rights Advocate and Centennial Committee Co-Chair for the League of Women Voters here in the Richmond area. 
So, um, you know, there are so many points of intersection um, that were brought up in that uh, uh, dramatized conversation, fictional conversation between these women. And I just wanted to ask you all um, a, a couple of questions um, regarding, you know, what we know about the facts and research and, and just how we um, can kind of bring forward some of the ideas that these women um, had um, over 100 years ago. So, Lynn, I'll start with you. Um, we, we heard from um, Sally Mae Dooley's uh, point of view around her involvement with the um, Virginia Association opposed to women's suffrage. And I think when we think about women's suffrage, we don't often think about the idea that there would have been uh, opposition um, from women <laughs> um, about the 19th Amendment. And so I'm curious about, um, you know, why uh, these women might have felt the need to form this organization in the first place. Well, you have to understand the culture of the times. Uh, it's, it's always... Uh, Good to have that perspective. If we look all the way back to Virginia's history, we were uh, Virginia was the wealthiest state in the Union at the in the American Revolutionary time. It was largely agrarian, but it was ruled in the General Assembly, of course, by men, white white men who were landowners, and it was still very restricted, and it was always the providence of men to, to uh, take on the governance of, of the Commonwealth. Moving forward, uh, Virginia was very agrarian. It was uh, almost a totally agricultural state with a few uh, cities, very small city areas. Uh, with the Mexican War, there was westward expansion, and with it, there were much wider openings for women to uh, take more role in the governance in the western states and that began to filter back to the eastern states as well that that uh, women could take positions and uh, important roles in the the governance of their own matters so this came forward just as in the background but the culture of, of um, men keeping the arena of politics and women keeping to the sphere of the home and the hearth. That was very much divided and, and uh, the roles were pretty well defined. And it was important for the women of the time to maintain this uh, separation, which gave them a, a, a degree of uh, status and also let them avoid responsibility, which later would they had to come to terms with. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah, that, you know, um, again, it's interesting because we, you know, don't often kind of hear that from that point of view. And um, when we're talking about the suffrage movement, we are hearing um, about women who were advocating uh, for their rights and, you know, um, and, and to kind of hear the other side of things where it's like, well, we also have the right to just home and hearth as well. Um, and so just in, in thinking about how, you know, um, that feels like it's a way of life that could be stripped away um, suddenly, um, we can um, imagine that there would be women that are opposed to that. Um, so, Elva, I wanted to talk to you a little bit. Um, we've talked in the past about um, the um, Negro reformatory movement specifically um, and, you know, um, how Maggie, uh, Nina Walker and Aura Brown Stokes um, were a part of that movement. Um, and, you know, I think we, they were, you know, we, we can think of them as we know of, of them as, as performing primarily on the local stage as far as those movements were concerned. Um, but, um, you know, we do know that they were known nationally as well. Um, but we don't really, this, in coming on the research, up on the research to learn more about um, um, the role of black women in the suffrage movement, Or Brown Stokes is not someone that I'd heard of before. Um, so I'm wondering if you can educate us a little bit more um, around her and just, again, you know, what types of organizations she and Maggie Walker were a part of. Oh, absolutely. Um... First and foremost, I want to put forth uh, one of the seminal works that was published in 2020 uh, that is a must read, and that is Dr. Martha S. Jones's book, Vanguard. Uh, perhaps people can post up the post the entire book's uh, uh, title somewhere during this. 
Uh, it doesn't really start with them because they were very well connected to national organizations of colored women, if you will. And to give you a little background, we can actually look at Sojourner Truth, uh, Harriet Tubman, and people like Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, uh, who was born in 1844. You've got myriad women who were uh, in the trenches and as far as being suffragists prior to you know, Maggie Walker and our Ora Brown Stokes and others. So having said that, it's important to connect those women to the larger organizations. And uh, as you stated, uh, they were statewide, but they were also nationally known. It's not by happenstance that we see that that Negro organization or Negro reformatory organization and that movement started in the sort of the mid 1890s, because at the time in 1896, we had the founding of the National Association of Colored Women. And Josephine uh, <clears throat> LaPierre Ruffin was uh, a founder of the forerunner of that. Now, the forerunner was, of course, the Women's Era Club. It was national uh, in scope, but uh, Mrs. Ruffin also was the founder and editor of the very first known uh, nationally circulated uh, newsletter slash magazine by and for Black women, the Women's Era. And our Rosa Bowser was the Virginia correspondent for that. So having said that, uh, Mrs. Ruffin was uh, diligent uh, in being an abolitionist and a suffragist. And so, you know, it just didn't start with the 1890s, but we see a groundswell because of those national organizations. You know, these colored women clubs that also had Virginia branches and uh, local branches. So with that, people like Ida B. Wells, Barnett and others noticed that we had children that were being criminalized and, uh, you know, our girls and women were not safe. And so they uh, sought to mitigate the effects of those things in founding the Virginia State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs in circa 1907, and also local branches. And so they worked with the uh, and were well known with the, well known as far as the national branches. And so one of the first things born out of that was the creation of the Virginia uh, Industrial School for colored girls out in uh, Hanover County circa 1915. And it was sought to give them a safe haven and train uh, girls with skills that could be used. And so, you know, this was interracial in scope because the state took it over, but these are just some of the things. So when we talk about the term intersectionality, uh, what that means is this, uh, our women were never able to focus on just voting alone, you see you know, that had to mitigate some other things, but moreover with the connections, with Mrs., back to Mrs. Ora Brown Stokes, uh, she was the Southeastern leader of that National Association of Colored Women at one point. And so she sought locally and nationally to, you know, mitigate the effects of uh, disparities. Uh, she was a brilliant lady. Uh, she graduated from what is now Virginia State University did further work at Harshon, where she was also a uh, trustee and graduate work at the University of Chicago. And Mrs. Stokes later graduated from Virginia Union University's law school in 1930. And so we had brilliant women and it took all of that brilliance to mitigate the effects of that uh, Virginia constitution of 1901 to 1902 where there was you know, literacy tests and poll taxes were implemented that knocked out a lot of black men and also poor, poor white men. And so these are the challenges that they were up against and they prevailed. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, we have, you know, in making those connections and learning more about Aura Brown Stokes um, and her connection specifically to uh, Nora Housen and Adele Clark and the founding of the Interracial Cooperation Committee, um, that was in doing the research just something really interesting to me to learn more about um, um, all of these women who were a part of the suffrage movement here in Richmond specifically. Um, and so we know about them here uh, locally, um, and I'm wondering if there were other uh, women from Richmond who were influential on the local, uh, on local and national suffrage stage um, that we should that we should know more about. Um, Lynn, I'll turn that question to you. Well, we have some wonderful women on whose shoulders we have 
fortunately stood. Uh, of course, we go way back to the uh, the original hundred years for the suffrage movement moving forward fr uh, from Seneca Falls. But in Virginia, the uh, Equal Suffrage League was formed in 1909. And this came out of uh, uh, a whole era of uh, awakening and reform uh, was in the air because there was so many disparities and issues that were uh, coming forward and then there were voices of courage. And that was the exciting part uh, that women were starting to step out into the public arena. They got a lot of opposition, a lot of pushback. Uh, they were ridiculed and harassed, but they still saw that they, they had been charged as the champions for, for the youth, for women, for the underserved. There were no safety nets at that time. Uh, the cities were becoming uh, more crowded. People were moving into the cities after the Industrial Revolution out of the countryside. There, the labor conditions were dismal. The, uh, there was child labor, women exploitation, uh, no minimum wage, no, no social welfare. Uh, this was a, a time that changes were apparent changes needed were were desperately needed and it was up to the women who had the notion of humanitarian reform and this, they were the the voices who came together it began uh one of the places of course was the uh women's club which uh richmond women's club it was viewed with great opposition and suspicion by the men the, the husbands but uh, as being a seedbed for radical ideas and indeed the women's suffrage and the vote became one of their uh, focus areas and so the equal suffrage league was uh, brought forth the first women to come into the arena of politics and change so that was a very exciting time yeah uh, and I can imagine that uh, kind of bringing that forward with the uh, centennial a um, couple of years ago and just kind of really uh, getting to help um, all of Virginia and Richmond in particular learn more about these women specifically um, through you know, the, the parades and interpretation and you know, just kind of um, making sure that people understand that you know, Richmond really did have, um, um, what's the word? Uh, a really strong cohort <laughs> of women who were on the front of this movement as well. So, um, Elva, we were we were chatting a little bit before as well about um, the specific scene that uh, Maggie and Aura in the dramatic interpretation are painting about, um, you know, what it was like after the 19th Amendment had passed. Um, and they were, you know, at City Hall here uh, in Richmond, and, you know, they were, you know, going in to register to vote. Um, and, you know, I'm wondering if you can kind of describe that scene a little bit for us as, as, you, as you know it. Um, and then also answer the question around, you know, um, were there, we don't hear a lot about, again, uh, women's, uh, Black women's suffrage is prior to the 19th Amendment. We hear a lot about them kind of you know, after the amendment is passed and kind of really getting folks to the polls. But I uh, wonder if you can paint that scene for us and then also talk a little bit about um, um, just kind of, you know, what uh, it was like to make sure that folks were uh, getting to the polls and exercising their rights to vote um, after that time. Uh, sure. Um, we know by newspaper accounts uh, of that fateful day, that first day where people, women could vote, uh, register, I should say. And so black women packed City Hall as well as white women. And they really didn't know what to do because you know people packed the uh, halls at the same time. So all of a sudden they decided that they would uh, send the black women uh, who came to register down to the basement, uh, past the coroner's office, you know, mm -hmm. to a makeshift place to, to uh, register, uh, you know, Maggie Walker stayed on top of things as it relates to the ability for black women to register because oftentimes the hours were not sufficient and there were tons of black women in line when the uh, lines closed for the day. 
And so she lobbied vehemently for more assistant registrars and uh, extended times, if you will. Uh, she even approached a judge about this. She did not let up. We can see by her own diary interest, uh, entries, you know, at City Hall today, at City Hall today. She stayed on top of it. But one of the things that uh, I think many people haven't been exposed to is that these ladies trained and were educated to answer those uh, tough questions that were put before them, you know, as a part of the registration process. And I was surprised myself to learn through some of the newspaper accounts that the uh, whites, if you will, were surprised at how well black ladies dealt with those registration questions that were meant to trip them up. Keep in mind the 1901-1902 convention, you know, uh, uh, constitutional convention in Virginia, you know, sought to curtail any type of voting rights. So it was challenging. You, you, you really didn't know what you were going to be asked. But we now know that they drilled at the St. Luke, St. Luke building and they educated one another. You had brilliant ladies who were leaders nationally. You know, we know Maggie Walker as a bank president here. But she was an educator and she led an organization that was, had a presence in over 20 states and at least 60,000 members. And so these ladies were not only brilliant, but they were savvy as it relates to collectivism. And so they drilled, and not only did the ladies drill, but you had brilliant black uh, male lawyers who assisted them. We know that Giles Jackson assisted, assisted in prepar, uh, preparing them, but moreover, one of the power, most powerful things uh, I've seen is that uh, when you look at the first um, registrants, you see his wife and daughters on the same page. You know, his wife was born in slavery like he was. And so you see this line of people that I recognize, you know, right away, uh, almost, you know, most of Jackson Ward and other places uh, was Jackson Ward, I should say, because it's important to know that Jackson Ward ceased to be a voting district after that convention for the most part. So the majority of the black population after that was located in the Lee Ward. Okay, and I was astounded in prepar uh, preparing for this today to find out that there were rumblings that perhaps, since it was almost a majority black ward, that Maggie Walker might have been interested in making a run for city council. And I'd never seen that before. Wow. So I thought that it was interesting. That would have made her the first lady of any ethnicity. But it's not by happenstance. Next year in 1921, she voted. I mean, I'm sorry, she ran for the statewide office of superintendent of public education on that Lily Black ticket where John Mitchell ran for governor. So the plot thickens. But mm -hmm. keep in mind, these ladies were brilliant, uh, they were savvy, they had done national work, and they were ready. So much so that even the uh, white majority newspapers gave them their props, if you will, based on how prepared these black women were. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I had no idea about Maggie Walker's little potential run for council. And, you know, um, it really is fascinating as you continue to, to dig into the history and um, um, which is, I think, just so important, right? It's important for us to have a, a really under, a good understanding of the foundation of, you know, um, what these women and these people um, went through, right? Um, and how we can kind of carry that forward today. And so, um, so my next question to you both is just how has, um, uh, in your opinion and, and, and through your own observation, the legacy of, of these women who were vanguards um, carried through today? Okay. Go ahead. You're on the Okay. All right. <laughs> I'd like to lift the, up the names of two ladies, if I might. Number one, Ethel Thompson Overby. Uh, Mrs. Overby had the uh, distinction of becoming the first Black woman to be appointed to be a principal in 1933 in the public schools at the Elba School. This lady was very dynamic and wedded to getting out the vote. So she was a member of a forerunner of what would become the Richmond Crusade for Voters in the 1950s. And this voting organization was inarguably the, uh, probably the most successful voting rights or education, voter education uh, 
uh, organizations in the entire South. And so she was one of the founding members of that, and she was an active member going door to door of the organization that was the forerunner of that one. So Ethel Thompson Overby is someone that should be lauded for that also. And then lastly, a contemporary lady, uh, Miss Clovia Lawrence. We know her as Miss Community, uh, but Mrs. Ms. Lawrence has been dedicated to getting out the vote and getting you know, organizing transportation for years and bringing in um, candidates to explore topics, but also she has been monumental in educating folks on their restoration of rights. And so I would say miss, uh, two people quickly, uh, Mrs. Ethel Thompson Overby, the late Ethel Thompson Overby, and Miss Clovia Lawrence, Miss Community as we know her. Miss Community, all right. <laughs> Look forward to uh, looking out for Miss Community and learning more information about just, you know, all the impact that she's had. Um, and Lynn, how, and in, in your thoughts, um, how has the legacy of these women been brought forward? Good, we talked about the Equal Suffrage League and uh, how it be, began to bring people together. It, then it moved and became the League of Women Voters. And this is when people, uh, women really moved out into the political arena. But at that time in the 20s, which was the a, a very exciting time, some of the names that we should remember, of course, are Lila Mead Valentine, who was president of the Suffrage League. Then the, when the League of Women Voters was formed, she was their first president. And along with her went her uh, friends and colleagues, Adele Clark and her lifelong partner, Nora Houston, were artists and women's rights activists from the beginning, Ellen Glasgow, writer, Mary Johnston, uh, Ann Clay Crenshaw held some of the first meetings in her home. The Crenshaw House has a historical marker on, on Franklin Street. Mary Branch Munford was a wonderful educator and one of her wonderful points of intersection was that she helped bring uh, compulsory education, uh, bringing children out of the, the labor force, the child labor laws and exploitation, bringing them more education, also bringing better, uh, much better conditions to the black schools who were always uh, underserved. So, and then Dr. Kate Waller Barrett, where there was a terrible tuberculosis outbreak. Uh, she brought together better hospitals for both the black and white communities and, and uh, the visiting nurse association. Lucy Randolph, of course, is well known as, our, as an educator. So there are many points of intersection of the communities where the women form coalitions to support each other and uh, to just elevate all of society. Yeah. And again, we're still seeing the impact of those women and the organizations that they, they form today. Um, and so you're saying Mary Mumford, it's like, oh, wait a minute, is that elementary school? <laughs> her, you know? And as I'm just continuing to like, you know, um, um, put, make all of these connections um, uh, for the Richmond community and beyond, um, it's really um, astonishing and astounding um, the amount of, of work that went in um, and, you know, how we are able to continue to, to benefit and gain from them today. Um, so, Lynn, I'll, I'll ask you this question. Um, you know, what type of work does the League of Women Voters do today, and again, just a reminder to, to anyone watching, um, Equal Suffrage League here in Richmond um, became the League of Women Voters, and they are still very much active um, to this day. Um, very, so very <laughs> I know that you are very busy, woman, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you know what types of um, what types of work they continue to do. Well, from the start, uh, their goal was to educate women who are now entering the voting force and they needed to know what the issues were and how to advocate. And they formed uh, civics classes for the curriculums for the high schools to educate the youth and to uh, even the candidates. Uh, they held candidate forums where they held candidates uh, uh, for legislative offices accountable trying to uh, remove some of the hotbeds of corruption and uh, misplaced uh, governance. <laughs> so the, from the very start, they were holding uh, public forums 
and public education. Uh, always from the start, the mission has been nonpartisan. So there would be great trust in, in how uh, governance was, was dispensed, that there would be no, no affiliation that would be disparaging one group or another. Uh, so they, so the purpose of is to build a stronger democracy where all citizens participate, are educated to the the issues of the day, and have a voice. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so I have, um, you know, one final question from me. And if there's um, anyone who has a question um, who is uh, from our viewing audience, please feel free to throw them into the chat. Um, but, you know, I'm curious about what you believe is the most important lesson uh, that we could learn from these women today. And I'm, I'm sure I say the, the most important, but I'm sure you have um, many <laughs> that you might um, think that they would impart on us. Um, but um, Alva, what, what, are, what are your thoughts there? Uh, first of all, let me go back to Miss Clovia Lawrence. She's a major radio personality. You may hear her on the Radio One uh, stations, but a powerful community leader uh, and Virginia Union University graduate, Clovia Lawrence. Uh, I would say several things uh, are, are wonderful for us to take away from studying the history of this. And one is the power of collectivism. Uh, the power of educating ourselves on topics and candidates, uh, also the power of faith. You know, we can't underestimate, you can never overestimate the power of faith and really in the black church as it relates to collectivism, both um, contemporarily and historically. Also, the, it serves as a blueprint as it relates to interracial cooperation. You know, we have uh, Mary Branch Munford, we also had Dr. Uh, Samuel C. Mitchell of the University of Richmond, who was you know, working with our people over a century ago. And so it, it's, a, it's a powerful blueprint uh, collectively. And then also, if I might add that you know, it's only six degrees of separation in that we talked about Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, born you know, in Boston area, 1844. She was an abolitionist and she was a part of interracial uh, abolitionist groups but she was also a suffragist. Uh, there is a Richmond connection there. Of course, she was free. Uh, her husband, George Lewis Ruffin, was a Richmonder, and he had the distinction of becoming the first known gra Black graduate of Harvard University's law school in 1869. So they were lobbying back then, and she had a helpmate from Richmond who was of uh, great importance. As a matter of fact, Frederick Douglass had our George Lewis Ruffin write the, the foreword for his autobiography. And so there are many stories like that that connect us to nationally known people. You see our Rosa Bowser um, uh, authored articles and publications national, nationally. So we must never forget that these ladies weren't simply local, they were brilliant leaders who were nationally respected. And I yield back my time. <laughs> Thank you. I could we could go on and on all day. I mean, you know, just, uh, you know, the the most again fascinating um, thing about all of this for me, and I think one of the reasons I wanted to make sure that we were um, having this conversation is all of these connections uh, between these people, you know, um, and you know, just uh, making sure that folks realize that you know we have such uh, a capacity here um, in the Richmond area uh, for people to learn even more about um, the history of these movements um, and how they um, inspired and, and, and were intersectional with um, so many other movements uh, nationwide. So, um, uh, and Lynn, if you could uh, ponder on, you know, uh, important uh, takeaways from um, these women um, in this particular moment in history. I think one of the unique contributions when women finally did step forth into the public arena was co collaboration and realizing that their voices could be a voice for change for the common good. And that was a, a very big shift in, in uh, cultural recognition that women had something important to say and could actually make it happen. 
And because they would work together so beautifully in coalitions and in by collaborating with other women's groups, uh, seeing where the problems were, where there were humanitarian reforms to be made, uh, it was awfully important from the start that this contribution be recognized. And, and I think now we are seeing such a, a a force for good. We have a, a third of our General Assembly now are women. They've taken positions of prominence and, and power all across the nation. Uh, Virginia is recognized as a leader in in Washington and as are still observers of the United Nations for women's rights. So we know that the the uh, the common goal. I think that's that's one of the one our take takeaways to elevate society by uh, advocating, lobbying, becoming educated participants in democracy. And I think a very special note was during the, this, these, these gr the grilling of our new judge candidate, Judge Jackson. She had endured an entire hard day and at the very end under her breath almost softly into the mic, she said, persevere, and she persisted. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for joining us and, and as we learn more about um, these women and their impact and their perseverance uh, mm -hmm. in you know, making sure that we are able to uh, enjoy some of the rights that we do today. Um, and I hope that uh, you know, you will found this um, as well as watching viewing audience um, as uh, informational <laughs> and um, really a joyful conversation right around you know how we can continue to build on the legacy of these women. And so we thank you for joining us and we invite you to uh, continue to join us for our programs with historical education at Maymont Foundation. Uh, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>